Hi, everybody. Uh, people are still wandering in, so I think I'll just give it a minute, and uh, then we'll start. Okay, good evening. I'm David Schwartz, Vice President of the Temple Shalom Men's Club. Welcome to our talk, Berlin, the History of a City for Germans and Jews. Uh, our talk will be presented by my friend, Dr. Chris Friedrichs, a longtime Temple member and professor emeritus of history at UBC, where he taught European and world history for 45 years. This is the uh, third time uh, we've been lucky enough to have uh, Chris speak to uh, the men's club, and uh, we have 160 people registered for this talk, a new men's club record. Uh, I think the snow and weather had something to do with it. <clears throat> Chris, uh, you know uh, from his uh, Yom Kippur talks, the Rhoda Friedrichs Memorial Lecture in memory of his beloved wife, Rhoda. I'm very excited to hear this talk. Uh, in 2019, my wife and I were visiting Berlin and had the pleasure of having breakfast in Berlin with Chris uh, asking him for some tips of what we should visit while we were there. Um, Chris has agreed to answer questions at the end of the talk. And without further ado, I welcome Chris. Thank you. So like every talk by any speaker, I'm beginning with the famous words, can you hear me? No. <laughs> <laughs> now I can get down to work. So when... when uh, Larry and uh, David, in particular from the men's club, asked if I would give a talk sometime in November, and it's still November for another five hours. Uh, I, um, I am using the mic. That's why I asked if people could hear me. This is a secret mic. Okay, I am using the mic. But if you want, you can sit closer. This is the best I can do. <laughs> right. um, the, uh, when I agreed to give the talk, I, I sent them two suggested topics, and one um, would have covered about uh, 50 years of history, but the other one uh, uh, covered about 350 years of history, and that's the one they picked. And I only later realized, what did I get in for? 350 years of history um, is a bit of a earful, I think. And, you know, you don't normally want to talk like this to go more than about an hour. And I will really try very hard. I've already used up one minute, so I've got 59 minutes left, and I've got 59 slides. <laughs> and I'm hoping I can pull this, everything together in those 59 minutes. Uh, after that, when I'm finished, uh, we arrange that we'll take about a three-minute break. Those who feel that now, they've, now that they've heard the talk, they want to go, I won't be offended. As long as you, on the way out, look at something in the temple, Shalom Foyer, that I will mention as part of my talk. And others will, I hope, want to stay for a question and answer and a very informal discussion. And while those who happen to be leaving are leaving, those who want to stay for the discussion, you know, you can move a little more forward or something. So we're a, a smaller group, and I'll come down here and we'll talk about questions you may have or comments you want to make. Berlin, a city for Germans and Jews. And the thing I'm trying to get across is this is not just a lecture about Jews in Berlin. It's, Berlin is an endlessly interesting city that happens to also have been a city with a very significant Jewish community in the past and again in the present. And um, so I'm talking partly about just the history of Berlin and partly about the role played in Berlin by the Jews who lived in Berlin. So it's covering an awful lot of ground, but I hope 
we can, I hope you'll find it interesting to go racing through the history of what is unquestionably Germany's most interesting city in 59 minutes. And we have to start with the Holy Roman Empire. Could spend 59 minutes talking about this remarkable political entity in medieval and early modern Europe, but I won't. I will tell you that it was a collection of principalities, and one of them was in North, northern Germany, and it was called Brandenburg. And the uh, prince of Brandenburg had a, the peculiar title of elector because a very small number of princes in Germany had the special privileges of electing the next Holy Roman Empire when emperor when the last emperor died, and, and he was one of them. So it was the electorate of Brandenburg, whose capital city was a rather modest city of Berlin. Now, in the 18th century, the interesting things happened. Brandenburg had expanded considerably in its territory and included an area called Prussia and started to be called Brandenburg, Prussia. And uh, the electors of Brandenburg got a promotion in their title. At the course of the 18th century, they came to be called the kings of Prussia. So Berlin was now the capital of a kingdom within the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, the royal, uh, uh, you know, the elector's palace was expanded and made bigger. So by the end of the 18th century, there was this rather grand palace uh, in the heart of Berlin. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in Berlin, a Jewish community had developed. And um, that's and it's a very important story. Back in the 17th century, late 17th century, the then elector of Brandenburg uh, ruled over a territory where almost all of the people who lived there were German Lutheran Protestants. But he was very interested in seeing economic growth in his, in his, uh, in his electorate, as they called it. And in one of the groups he was eager to get to move was, were uh, French Protestant Huguenots. In 1685, the King of France, Louis XIV, decided that uh, all Protestants, he was, a, Louis XIV was a very devout Catholic, decided that all the Protestants in, in France had to convert to Catholicism or leave. And uh, many of them left. And the Elector of Brandenburg said, come to my principality, because the Huguenots were known to be economically very vital. And a few years before that, something Comparable happened in, in Austria. In uh, the Habsburg rulers of Austria uh, declared that all the Jews were no longer welcome in Vienna and had to leave Vienna. And the elector of Brandenburg didn't invite all the Jews of Vienna to come to Berlin. He invited the rich ones. The well-to-do Jews of Vienna were invited to come to Berlin to carry on their economic enterprises in Berlin, and they were glad to do it. Not all the Jews who ended up in Berlin were themselves wealthy because they could bring along a certain number of their servants and so on. And they had, uh, and a few more kind of came in, and it was very complicated rules. There were Jews with more privileges because they were richer, and other Jews who weren't given quite the same privileges that were allowed to live there. By, by 1714, there were uh, about 120 Jewish families in Berlin, and they, only with permission, everything had to be with permission, uh, got permission to build a synagogue. So this synagogue was built in Berlin in 1714 and remained in use until 1938. And I don't have to tell this audience what happened in 1938. I'll mention it when we get there. but. So the Jews, there was really a Jewish community in Berlin, and uh, it was thriving, except that Jews, as in every European place where they lived, uh, had to deal with all sorts of restrictions and permissions and what kind of property they were allowed to own and what kind of um, uh, enterprises they were permitted to carry out and were not. But within that framework, uh, Jews were encouraged to engage in various activities, particularly of a financial character, because this was so valuable for the rulers, and that's exactly what happened. Well, in 1743, the most famous Jew in Berlin, or the, most, the person who became the most famous Jew in Berlin, 
uh, arrived as a 14-year-old boy from the small town of Dessau. His beloved rabbinical teacher had moved to Berlin, and he followed his teacher. He spoke at that point Yiddish and was very good at Hebrew. He was a very good student. This was a young man who came to be known as Moses Mendelssohn. Arrived in Berlin, 1714, got right to work studying more, becoming a very knowledgeable in Jewish, you know, in, in all the forms of Jewish knowledge, but also decided he should learn proper German instead of just Yiddish and learn French and learn some English and so on. And uh, he became enormously erudite and he began reading works of philosophy. This was the period, not just he was very learnedly Jewish, but he also wanted to learn what was going on in the world of, of, uh, of non-Jewish philosophy. This was the period of the Enlightenment and he was, um, uh, became a very prominent philosopher of the Enlightenment and was, had a lot of connections with the German Enlightenment philosophers and so on, became very well known. And eventually he came to the attention of the king of Prussia, Frederick the Great, who um, was persuaded by some of his uh, uh, advisors that you must invite this very brilliant man to Potsdam, which was about 20 miles from Berlin where there were royal palaces so that the kings of Prussia, they moved around there, the, the, the same, the palace I showed you, they had another one about three miles from the heart of Berlin called Charlottenburg, they had another palace in Potsdam about 20 miles away, they liked their lots of palaces. And uh, Frederick the Great lived in Potsdam, mostly was in Potsdam, and rather with mixed feelings invited this person he'd been told was brilliant to come to Potsdam and uh, for a little gathering of philosophers and then at the last minute, and here's a picture that was made. This was considered such a significant event that a Jewish intellectual would be invited to meet the king of Prussia that some years later this picture was made exaggerating a little bit the fact that Mendelssohn was very short and the Prussian soldiers were very tall. You know, it was a, it's, it's, it's a picture that reflects certain attitudes of that time. It was certainly not, a, it was of course a Christian artist. But the, the trouble is that uh, the king changed his mind and didn't, wasn't there for this little gathering. So this whole trip, by the way, I should mention that the king had invited Mendelssohn for um, one of the Jewish holidays. Not realized, they paid no attention to that. And, and this was a problem because Mendelssohn really wasn't sure he could walk 20 miles to, <laughs> but a, a, a group of rabbis deliberated and decided having this brilliant Jewish philosopher meet the king of Prussia was so important they would give him a dispensation and allowed him to take a coach and then in the end he never met the king of Prussia but it was still regarded as a very important event and uh, it, it, it created a sense among some Christians that uh, we have to uh, be able, we have to be willing to deal with, with, with Jews not just in economic terms, but it was because Mendelssohn was so special. Meanwhile, Berlin is growing as the capital of what is emerging as the most important of the principalities in the Holy Roman Empire. Like uh, most uh, German cities, it, it had a wall that wasn't really maintained very, very significantly anymore. There were gates uh, to let people in and out. And the uh, successor of Frederick the Great decided that the gate, the so-called Brandenburg Gate, uh, wasn't grand enough. It was kind of the, with the most frequently used entrance into Berlin. So he arranged in 1788 to have a rather modest little gatehouse uh, torn down and replaced by this grand gate, the Brandenburg Gate, which is still there where it was erected in the year 1791. And as you'll see, became a, I'm sure if any of you, and I know many of you have been to Berlin, I can't imagine you missed seeing the Brandenburg Gate built in this form 1791. Now um, this is a time when uh, as I mentioned more and more um, of the Berlin not Jewish elite and more and more of the Berlin intellectual and cultural elite kind of uh, felt that they should uh, have some contact with each other and we are moving into a period uh, known as the era of the Jewish salons. A salon was a gathering where people would come, and a salon, you know, one of the very few ro roles for elite women in, in uh, late 18th century France and Germany and other countries was to host these gatherings 
where people could, and it was mostly men who attended. But the woman who hosted it was expected to be very well read, very erudite, very knowledgeable. And a number of Jewish women from elite Jewish families hosted these salons. Some of them had married non-Jews, Christians. And um, some of them eventually converted to Christianity, but it often was a very slow process before they did that. And at the point, at the time when they were hosting these salons, this was uh, in most of these cases uh, when they were still actively Jewish and people accepted that. So uh, this is just two of the most famous, uh, uh, Rahel Levin van Hagen. Van Hagen was the name of her husband, who was not Jewish. This was Henrietta Hertz, whose husband was Jewish. Um, and uh, there was another one, was a daughter of Mendelssohn himself. And they hosted these gatherings, and it was, uh, again, a kind of a period where the elite society of Christians and Jews were mingling in certain ways whereas most of the Jews in Berlin uh, who weren't at that prominent level would have had, as so often the case in Jewish history in Europe, economic and financial contact with Jews, but no social contact. Anyway, the era of the salons kind of eventually died out. Uh, this is a very turbulent period of European history. It's the time of the Napoleonic Wars and so on, when the map of Europe got constantly rearranged depending on what Napoleon was or wasn't conquering. And what then, of course, Napoleon loses the Battle of Waterloo, and that period is over. And what emerged was a new map of Germany. It was no longer a, the Holy Roman Empire and uh, with maybe all these different principalities. There were only 38 separate states in Germany in what emerged in 1815. And the largest one, which is the one that you see in sort of dark yellow on the maps, is, um, was the Kingdom of Prussia. It was the, by far the largest of the 38 states. And its capital was, of course, Berlin. And being the capital of the most important of the 38 German states, Berlin not didn't take long for Berlin to clearly establish itself, which it had not really been before, as the most important German city. There were other important cities for political and economic reasons, but Berlin le leapt ahead of other cities and became the number one German city in this era. This is, ta this is a picture uh, at the heart of Berlin along that famous avenue, the Unter den Linden, under the linden trees that went from the Royal Palace to the Brandenburg Gate, and it still does. And uh, Berlin is a growing city, for, you know, and more and more Germans uh, uh, are turning up and people are going there for political reasons, for economic reasons, and so on. And of course, um, uh, Jews are turning up in Berlin. Uh, you still need, they still needed to get permission, but it was easier. The rules were being relaxed, though Jews were requiring more rights and so on. And between 1810 and 1860, uh, the Jewish population of Berlin, as you can see, grew from about 3,000 to about 30,000 Jews in, a, in, in the city of Berlin. And by the 1850s, it had become clear that that synagogue, the Alte Synagoge, that had been built in 1714 wasn't big enough for the growing Jewish community. So not far away, still very much in the heart of Berlin, um, uh, funds were raised, the Jews raised money in their community to build a new and much bigger synagogue. And that came to be known as the new synagogue, the Neue Synagoge. And uh, this was completed in 1866. The architectural style is quite interesting because the Jews of that period wanted to build synagogues that were as in, if they could, and in Berlin, because it was such a rich Jewish community, they wanted to build a synagogue that was as impressive as a church, but it shouldn't look at all like a church. And the synagogues were normally built in what was called the Moorish style, vaguely evocative of the domed you know, mosques and so on that they'd seen pictures of because um, the, the kind of dome shouldn't look like, you know, the dome of St. Peter's or something. It should look what they consider more oriental so that it had, it would never be mistaken for a church, but it would be recognized as an important religious building. And that is 
the, what the neue synagogue, neue synagogue looked like. This is the front where all the reception halls and everything, and in the back was a very huge sanctuary, which uh, uh, was certainly on a, uh, could often be quite full because the Jewish community of, German, of Berlin was growing. Well, in 1871, there's an important event, uh, the culmination of a process that took almost a decade and involved various wars and conflicts and so on. Uh, the key political player was Otto von Bismarck, you've all heard of him, the, the Prussian statesman who, whose diplomatic genius and sort of uh, created a set of circumstances that made it possible for the basically the 38 states of Germany to accept as inevitable that they should all be united under one ruler. They actually went on being calling themselves as kings. You know, there was a king of Bavaria and a king of Württemberg and a king of Saxony, but they were no longer really, their powers were very diminished because they would now accept that the king of Prussia would also be the German emperor and Germany would have a federal system, but the government would be in Berlin and Ber Bismarck, of course. So the king of Prussia is also the German emperor, William I, and Bismarck is the, uh, uh, goes on being the uh, chancellor of, of uh, now a united Germany. And that's, uh, and another thing that happened as a part of this process is there have been various rules in these 38 states about just how many privileges and rights could be given to Jews. And now a uniform rule would apply for the whole German Reich. Jews are citizens with all the standard political rights that any German citizen has as far as being able participating in politics, as far as where they could live and what businesses they could attract and so on. Jews were granted full equality. Many Jews hoped or imagined that this meant that now they were accepted as full members of German society. And we know that sadly, that was not really the case. There was still a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism in very many circles. In some cases, it was the kind of anti-Semitism that people avoided having contact with them. With them, in other cases, it was not allowing Jews, not admitting Jews to certain organizations and so on. Certain, uh, it was very, very hard for Jews to move up the ranks in something like the German military and so on. But, um, uh, and there were, of course, some virulent anti-Semites who were talked about, you know, we have to get rid of the Jews. But they were, at that point, a very marginal part of German society. And uh, we are dealing, sadly, today with the issue of the impact of extreme marginal anti-Semites, and I won't go into all that because I've got to get through the history of Berlin, but it, one has to be sensitive to comparisons. So now Berlin is the great imperial capital of Germany. This is imperial Berlin. It's growing by leaps and bounds. The population by 1900 is about 2 million, and the population of Jews in Germany is uh, well over 100,000, oh, in Berlin, I mean, sorry. The number of Jews in Berlin is now well over 100,000 and keeps growing. So this is the Berlin of the imperial era with the Kaiser, Kaiser William I, and then there's a briefly a Frederick, the, the, Frederick III, and then there's Kaiser William II and so on. Now, who were the leading members of Jewish society in Berlin? I want to mention just two of his examples. Gerson Bleischröder. He was, uh, I would say, must have been the second richest Jew in Germany, the richest one being the uh, head of the Rothschild family, the member of the Rothschild family who lived in Frankfurt at that point. And uh, he was certainly by far Bleischröder, Gerson Bleischröder was the richest Jew in Berlin. How did he acquire, uh, acquire that situation? Well, he started out quite modestly. He started out as a, an agent of the Rothschilds, but he started building up his own banking expertise and so on. And then at some point, he became acquainted with the ambitious politician Otto von Bismarck, who found that Bleich, Bleischroder became Bismarck's personal, private, financial banker and financial advisor. And as Bismarck became politically more and more important, he also 
uh, had Bleichroder take over more and more government financial business and handle certain loans. And there was the Franco-Prussian War that you all heard about, where Bleichroder um, uh, managed a lot of the financial aspects that uh, uh, the German government was involved with. He also ran his own bank in Berlin. There was a very grand building. You can see pictures of this uh, in the, uh, right in the heart of central Berlin. Bleichroder was enormously uh, influential with Bismarck, although Bismarck always tried to conceal the role that Bleichroder had played in Bismarck's memoirs. I think the name Bleichroder appears, if at all, only once, because he didn't want people to realize the degree to which his political success was partly due to the shrewd advice and the practical financial help that he got from this Jewish banker. But what was done for Bleichroder by way of thanks was he was given a new title. Bismarck asked the emperor to raise Bleichroder to the level of being a, a baron, a member of the nobility, which was not unheard of in Germany. The Rothschilds were made rotten nobles a few decades earlier, but it was still very rare for Jews to be given a title of nobility, but it was very important to Gerson von Bleichroder that he was now exactly what I said, Gerson von Bleichroder. You know that von is that all important thing you add to a title in German to show that the person is considered a noble. Well, Jews are contributing, other Jews are contributing to the life of Berlin in this period, the economic life. One of them is Georg, West, uh, Georg Westheim, who uh, came from a small city in northern Germany, moved to Berlin, opened a shop, became incredibly skillful. The shop grew and grew and grew. And by the end of the 19th century, he had constructed a magnificent, enormous department store. It was the biggest department store in Berlin. And uh, I'm sure it was also the biggest department store in all of Germany. And uh, this is just a picture. You walked into that department store and you walked into this atrium and you knew that you were shopping in a very important place where they had, uh, you could expect the finest possible goods. And, and uh, Germans of, uh, who could afford it uh, loved going to the Wertheim department store. The, and this is just a, a single example of the enormous role that Jews were playing in the economic uh, and social life of Berlin in this period. There's also an influx of Jews from Eastern Germany. Now, that one reason is that the Eastern parts of the German Empire had in earlier times been Poland and had a lot of Jewish shtetls of the kind that were typical in Poland. And when Germany took over those areas, they had a lot of Jews living in Eastern Germany whose way of life was not nearly as assimilated or integrated or acculturated as that of most German Jews. And uh, with Berlin booming, a lot of them moved uh, oops, I, I, I'm going too fast. I'll go back to that. Uh, a lot of these East German uh, uh, Jews from East German, uh, East Germany uh, were moving to Berlin, and they were settling in the Jewish neighborhoods of central Berlin precisely because most of the Jews who had lived in central Berlin had now, were now moving away from central Berlin. <laughs> they were sort of taking over the niche of Jewish life in central Berlin because many of the Jews who had lived in central Berlin, uh, were now moving to grander and more gracious neighborhoods in Berlin, a little further to the west, including the neighborhood of uh, Charlottenburg. And whoops, going there. There we go. And in Charlottenburg, which is in the western parts of Berlin, which tended to be considered the more elegant and gracious parts of Berlin, there was huge Jewish population. And they didn't all want to go back to the center of Berlin, to the Neue Synagoge, which was a long walk, or if they weren't following those rules, still inconvenient to get to. So more synagogues were, uh, were developed. And the only one I want to emphasize is the Fasan and the Fasanenstrasse synagogue in Charlottenburg, constructed, as you can see, in 1910, 1912, a very grand synagogue, which plays a significant role in some of the things I'm going to talk about. Well, two Years after the Fasanenstrasse synagogue was opened and started to come into use, uh, something happened that we all know about, namely World War I began. It's just from the fact that I'm only showing these headlines from 1914 to 1918, don't get the impression it was a short war, it was a dreadfully long war for those participating in it, needless to say. The only point I have time to make about World War I is that 
the German army included, because they were German citizens, a large number of Jews. It's been a, approximately 100,000 Jewish men fought as German soldiers in World War I, including the father of my late wife. Hans Schlange was a soldier in World War I. And uh, about 12,000 of those Jewish soldiers were among the countless large numbers of Jewish soldiers who were killed in action. I mention this because the fact that 100,000 Jews had served in World War I and the fact that 12,000 of them had been killed in action meant nothing 15 years later to the Nazis who came to power in 1933. But at the time, people felt the, the Jews of Germany and of Berlin felt we've made our contribution. Well, World War I, as you know, the Germans lost, the Kaiser abdicated, Germany becomes the Weimar Republic, and uh, people get confused about it. It was called the Weimar Republic, not because Weimar was the capital, but because the constitution for the new Weimar, Weimar Republic was written in the small town of Weimar. Berlin obviously went on being the capital of Germany. Population was now four million, and uh, there were getting close to 200,000 Jews in Germany, about close to two-fifths of all the Jews in, in Germany, I mean, uh, were roughly half a million Jews in Germany, and clo around close to two-fifths of them, 175,000, lived in Berlin. And these were great years for the Jews of Berlin. They were, by and large, prosperous. They were active. They were deeply involved in all sorts of fields of activity. Uh, uh, this picture shows the worshipers leaving the Fasan and Strasse synagogue after a service in 1928. 1928 was the peak year for the Jews of Germany in the entire 20th century. It was a year of prosperity. It was a year where most Jews, yes, they heard about these small anti-Semitic parties uh, and other anti-Semitic movements, but they didn't feel deeply impacted by them. It was the last year before the Great Depression began, and the Great Depression was going to lead to even worse things in Germany, which I'm going to get to. But let's talk for a moment. Uh, one of my friends asked if I was going to talk about the Roaring Twenties in Berlin, and I had to disappoint him by saying with the time at my disposal, I can't get Berlin to roar. It was a vibrant period of culture and activity of all sorts of dimensions, and uh, I um, wish I had time to talk about the role of many Jews in, in the development of German cinema and film and so on, but I don't. I just will mention the most, single most famous Jew in Weimar Berlin was this person. He was the most famous Jew in Weimar Berlin. He was a world famous physicist. He was an accomplished violinist. And very important for the point of what I'm talking about is he was a deeply committed Jew. You know that. He was very committed to his Jewish identity. And I, there's an interesting picture of him. Uh, uh, you can see that here. If you can't read the label, I'll read it aloud. Professor Einstein with Professor Alfred Lewandowski fe as featured performers at a fundraising concert for Jewish youth welfare groups in the Neue Synagoge in January 1930. And here's Einstein. Now, he wasn't as accomplished as a violinist as he was as a physicist, but he was very good at it. And whether people wanted to attend the concert because it was, uh, they wanted to hear Einstein, the famous violinist or the famous physicist, doesn't matter. They, you know, he could put on a good show and help raise money for valuable Jewish causes and so on. And this was uh, something worth knowing about. But, of course, then comes the big change, the depression, the rise of, of virulent um, uh, national socialist, uh, what shall I say, you know, nationalism, the, um, the, the intensive nationalism of the national socialists combined with their um, promises to overcome the depression linked as well to their anti-Semitism and essentially blaming the depression on the Jews, et cetera, et cetera, and a political turmoil leads to the rise, the establishment of Hitler's National Socialists as the government of Germany, and that, of course, impacts Berlin. 
I said to David Schwartz coming here, I'm almost embarrassed to have to stand in our sanctuary and show a picture of this man with a swastika, but if we're talking about the history of Berlin, we can't avoid doing that. Here he is, here is, he is being taken through the Brandenburg Gate most famous landmark in Berlin and one of those parades and so forth and so on. And I don't have to spend the time here describing in detail the step-by-step -step persecution of Jews that begins as soon as the Nazis come to power and how one new law and ordinance is passed after another, restricting them, banishing them from professions, not permitting them to carry out certain occupations, not permitting them to attend public events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One, one prohibition after another making the life of Jews in Berlin and in Germany increasingly and intolerable, but I will mention the event that took place uh, that we all know about in November 1938. And here is an image of what happened to the Fasanenstrasse synagogue, which had just been built 30 years before on the night of November 9th and 10th, uh, November 9th in, uh, uh, after, you know, in Kristallnacht. And this was happening to synagogues all over Germany. That they were, uh, you know, the glass was broken, the, the flames were, the fires were set, the flames produced these synagogues in different ways. The details differed. A thousand synagogues were damaged, made unusable, and so on in Kristallnacht, and much worse was bound to happen. But here I want to pause for a minute and mention something that I would like you to look at on the way out. We have, whoops, I'm, <coughs> there we go. Here in Temple Shalom, all of you know this, although I don't think any of us spend as much time as we should looking at it. Right in the foyer, you can't miss it on the way out, is this display case of interesting objects of one sort or another that the uh, uh, leaders of our, our shul have decided are worth putting there on display. And there's one thing you will see if you stop and look at this display case, you will see this and it is worth pausing to look at. And the story behind it is as interesting as this object. This object was given to someone in New Rochelle, New York, about 50 years ago, or 45 years ago. It was given by Rabbi Emeritus Jacob Shankman of Temple Israel in New Rochelle, New York, which by coincidence is my old hometown. And uh, Rabbi Shankman, then emeritus rabbi of that synagogue, had been a US Navy chaplain during World War II. And at one point he'd been stationed in or near Germany. And he had somehow obtained this broken fragment from the Fasanenstrasse synagogue. And he had always regarded it as one of his treasured objects. But he was a little concerned what would happen to it next. Well, just in those years, there was a young assistant rabbi from Canada who was serving for three years as the assistant rabbi of Temple Israel in New Rochelle, happened to be named Philip Bregman. And he formed a very warm friendship with the emeritus rabbi of the synagogue. And at one point, Rabbi Shankman said, I want you to have this because I want this to go to someone in a younger generation who will treasure it as much as I do, as a memento of this beautiful synagogue in Germany that was so terribly destroyed in 1938. And Rabbi Bregman brought it with him along with everything else. He got two very, he also bought something else very special from New Rochelle, namely his wife, Kathy, but that's another story. <laughs> but this special fragment from the Fasanenstrasse synagogue was one of, one is really one of Rabbi Bregman's most treasured belongings, but he decided at one point, he would often show it to people that he would like to have it on permanent display. So it is now uh, on display with this label, a piece from the inside of the Fasanenstrasse uh, synagogue, Berlin, destroyed on Kristallnacht, November 10th, 1938, on loan, Make sure on your way out, you take a look. Well, 
yes, Hitler was very glad that synagogues were being destroyed. But um, he also wanted other things to happen in Berlin. I have to say that Berlin was by no means Hitler's favorite German city. His favorite German city was Munich. And in fact, uh, partly because that's where he had risen to political power. And uh, uh, to recognize this, the Nazis called Munich the uh, Hauptstadt der Bewegung, the capital of the movement, the Nazi movement. But Hitler knew that Berlin was the capital of Germany. And he, in his vision of Germany becoming a superpower, Berlin also had to become a super city. And he actually commissioned his favorite architect, Albert Speer, to design, make plans for what Berlin should look like after the war that Hitler anticipated would happen. It should be massively changed. It was going to be dominated by an enormous north-south avenue with a huge kind of building at the southern end with an arc of triumph that would be vastly bigger than the Arc de Triomphe in Paris and then stretch northward to what would have been the world's largest assembly hall, the largest building in the, wall, the world for public buildings. And what would happen to the old monuments of Berlin? He didn't, he didn't tell Speer that they would be torn down. They would simply be dwarfed. That little red spot is where the Brandenburg Gate would be, and it would become nothing compared to this magnificent city with a mega city with mega buildings that Hitler was going to institute uh, as soon as possible on the basis of these designs. Well, I don't have to tell you what happened between then and 1945. Can't go into the story of that war, but we know that in 1945, Berlin did not look like this. Berlin looked like this as a result of the Allied bombing and everything else that was part of World War II. And incidentally, I mean, most of Berlin looked like this. The Neue Synagoge, interestingly, um, had, well, survived as a skeleton. The back part, the sanctuary part was almost completely gone. The front part was sort of a, a building skeleton but it was unusable and remained unusable, by the way. Uh, for maybe they had a few little offices there, but it was basically an unusable building for many decades to come. Well, this is the new situation in Germany. The Allies have won the war. The four major allies, the, uh, the Soviets, the Americans, the, French, the British, and the French, uh, divide Germany up into four occupation zones, the famous four occupation zones that were set up in 1945. The eastern zone was the Soviet zone. But they, all four of these allies, uh, the, the Berlin was in the Soviet section, but all four of them wanted part of Berlin. They wanted to feel that that just, they got their part of the role of, of, of being in charge of the capital of uh, Germany. So Berlin was also divided into four zones a Soviet zone, a French, a British, and an American zone, and that remained the case basically for four years. But in 1949, there were big changes. The three Western zones, the British, American, and French zones, the, 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 those three countries agreed to consolidate their three zones into a single country, which they would give self-government to. There were some restrictions at first, but eventually it became totally self-governing and uh, came to be known as the Federal Republic of Germany, or it's uh, 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 more commonly known as West Germany. The Soviet occupation zone was uh, declared and now a, a, an independent self-governing country called the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. However, it was going to be very closely controlled by the Soviet Union. And it was soon after this, the famous Iron Curtain, it stretched beyond uh, this uh, section of Germany, but the Iron Curtain is a physical barrier, barbed wire and guard fences and no man's land zones and so on, was constructed to separate the East German zone from the West German three zones, or East Germany from West Germany, because there was a growing realization that people 
in Eastern Germany already recognized that their communist system was not giving them as much prosperity as the capitalist system seemed to be giving to West Germany and to prevent people from moving from the East to the West, uh, they built the, the Iron Curtain. But Berlin was a rather complicated special case because um, just as in Germany, West Germany as a whole, the three Western zones of Berlin, the French, British, American zone, were consolidated into a single section and allowed to be self-governing. The Eastern part was declared an, you know, a separate city and had its own government, which had to be a communist government because it was controlled by the Soviet Union. However, despite having two totally separate governments, it was a unified city. You could go from east to west Berlin without any trouble. You could walk right through the Brandenburg Gate, which was right near the edge between the two, uh, uh, between, it was just inside the east, the, uh, German, uh, German East Berlin part. You could walk through any street from east to west or from west to east. Some people lived in the west but had a job in the east. Some people reversed. You could take the subway, you could take the bus. It was a unified single city with two separate governments. And that situation lasted for a while, and East Berlin was now declared the capital of East Germany, and uh, certain uh, new buildings were added and so on, and uh, West Berlin, uh, with its totally different economic and cult social system, was a city that was officially under the three Western Allied powers. It wasn't technically part of West Germany, although it, if, it functioned as if it was part of West Germany because West Germans and West Berliners could fly back and forth. There was a train route, but it was more complicated because that went through East Germany. You could, mostly they went back and forth by plane. And uh, West Berlin was a thriving city with uh, economic and cultural and social links to West Germany, although it was not um, technically part of West Germany. You could walk back and forth between East and West Berlin. And this led to a problem in 1960 and 1961 because more and more East Germans were now determined to get out of East Germany and go to West Germany where the economy was booming. And as Germans, they would be given instant German citizenship and immediately uh, be able to find work in the booming economy of West Berlin, of West Germany. And it was really very easy. You got permission, you had to give a reason. You got permission from the authorities to go to West Berlin. I gotta visit my aunt, she's sick, okay. Go to East, I mean you went, go to East Berlin. Yes, you go from other parts of East Germany to East Berlin. As Soon as you get to East Berlin, you just walk through the Brandenburg Gate, walk through the street, take the subway, you're in West Berlin. You then quickly knew that there was people who would help you get to the airport. From the airport, you took a plane to West Germany. You were welcomed with open arms. You were given your citizenship papers. You found a job. More and more people were doing that. And the East German, and especially well-trained professional people, the East German authorities consulting with Moscow said, you know, uh, wait a minute, we've trained these people as doctors or engineers or scientists and teachers or whatever. And the minute we finish training them, they leave us to go to West Germany. We have to stop this. And they did stop it in very specific physical ways. They built the Berlin Wall in August of 1961. This thing went up overnight. There was a barbed wire structure where there never had been one. Two to three days later, they started building the wall, and within hours almost, it, it suddenly was impossible for East Germans to cross that wall to West Berlin. So the Berlin Wall was built. It was now impossible to cross that border. And the Berlin Wall, which all of us looking around here know that um, we all remember the Berlin Wall. Maybe there are one or two people uh, who don't, but most of us, if I look around, will remember the Berlin Wall and will know that this became a powerful symbol of the Cold War. 1963, the American president, John F. Kennedy, came to Berlin. They'd made a place, a kind of a little stand where he could look over the wall uh, very near the Brandenburg Gate. And this is where he made a very famous speech. But you've got to think of this. 1943, just let's say 20 years earlier, 1943, Berlin represented the worst evil form of genocidal fascism that you could possibly remember. And the United States, along with Canada, Britain, and other countries, was waging war against this horrific government whose center was Berlin. A mere 20 years later, the American president is standing there 
in, on West Berlin soil looking over the wall to East Berlin and makes that famous remark, Ich bin ein Berliner. This is an amazing transition from what, how Americans thought about Berlin a mere 20 years before, but it's the way history works. What about Jews in Germany? Well, in 1933, there were about half a million Jews in Germany. Uh, the number of Jews, about half of them were fortunate, including people in this room, including uh, many people I've, I know in this room, there's Bill and all sorts of other people, about half of the uh, uh, Jews in Germany were able to get out of Germany, about half of the Jews were not, and we know what happened to them. Um, so by the end of the war, there were almost no Jews, a few in hiding, a few actually survived in hiding even in Berlin, but the number of Jews in Germany uh, was tiny. Uh, there was a brief large number of Jews who were brought, survivors from various parts of Eastern Europe who were brought to Germany to be in DP camps, displaced persons camps. Well, they didn't want to stay in Germany. They wanted to get out, and a lot of them eventually got to Israel and so forth, or Canada, US, and so on. So as of 1950, when all the, there were about 20,000 Jews in all of Germany, some who had been there in hiding and wanted to stay, some who were DPs, most of the Jews in Germany at that point were Jews who had been in those DP camps from wherever, Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, and so on, and um, uh, had maybe decided, gotten some job in Germany and decided to stay there. But there's a very small number of Jews in Germany, which had hardly grown. By 1989, that number had hardly grown. Some people turned up in Germany from various places and decided to stay there, but the number was very small. But there were Jews in Germany, and because Berlin was the biggest city in Germany, there were Jews in, in Berlin. And there were very small, tiny little Jewish congregations in various cities that got a little bit of support from the German government in various forms. And, and the biggest one of those tiny communities, or the biggest two, were in Frankfurt and Berlin. And here's a picture of a worship service in, in Berlin. This building is interesting. I showed you what happened to the Fasanenstrasse synagogue at Kristallnacht. Now, the, it was still in ruins in the 1950s, exactly the way I showed you a decision was made with some help from the, German, from the local government to simply tear down what was left of the Fasanenstrasse synagogue and build a, a community center for the small Jewish community of, of Berlin. And um, in the western part of Berlin, in Charlottenburg, they kept one, that portal, the portal that was the front entrance to the Fasanenstrasse synagogue was still standing, and they incorporated that into this otherwise entirely modernistic building. So it was the Jewish community center of Berlin that was a useful facility and had some educational programs and so on. Mostly, most of the Jews in Berlin at that point were from West Berlin. The number of Jews in East Berlin was very, very small. And of course, if you were a Jew in East Berlin where you felt uh, you could just walk across to West Berlin and feel a little more at home because the Jewish community there was a little bigger. But these were very small communities and things stayed that way. Basically, things stayed that way until 1989. I gotta move quickly. Uh, 1989, we, I'm sure we all remember this, the, the, the months leading up to dissolution of the Soviet empire, the different countries of Eastern Europe that were overthrowing the communist system and then that critical fascinating moment where the East German government, um, uh, in, in, under enormous pressure from the population that said other countries are overthrowing their government, what are you doing for us? And the government announced, well, we're going to loose, we're going to slightly relax the travel requirements and um, to make it a little easier to take trips to the West. And that's all it took. A huge number of people, as you remember, gathered on the East German side of the wall shouted up to these guards who'd been sh ordered and had done it to shoot anyone who tried to get across the wall said, we just heard on the radio the travel restrictions have been eliminated. And the East German guards were so confused and had so much was going on, they believed it. So, oh, they've been eliminated. Well, we can't shoot these people. And they climbed up on the wall and the wall was, within hours, was nothing. An amazing event in, in, in German and world history. And it also meant that things were very different in Berlin. 
It led, among other things, to the unification of Germany. A step-by-step -step process, there were some legal formalities. Within a year, Germany was a unified country again, and it was decided that Berlin should be the, the historic capital of Berlin. Decision was made in 1991. However, there wasn't really the infrastructure for a capital there. It took a number of years till enough government buildings and so on uh, were constructed, and that was by 1999. There was enough of an infrastructure to really move the West, the, the government of United Germany from Bonn in, in the Rhineland to Berlin, and since then it has been the capital of Germany. Well, what about the population? I begin with the population of Germany today, 2022. Population of Germany as a whole is about 84 million, and it has ethnic communities. By far the largest ethnic community in Berlin, uh, excuse me, in Germany as a whole is the Muslim community. It's a huge community and there's a history to that. Muslims, uh, mostly from Turkey, began, Turks began coming to Germany in West Germany in the 1960s because there was an enormous economic boom, a desperate need for workers, and the Turks and other, the Greeks and Turks and others were encouraged to come to Germany temporarily to work. Well, you know, when people come temporarily to work, conditions are good, they stay. So there's a large Turkish community in Germany. And then in subsequent years, various things happening in, in Muslim-dominated parts of the world. The, the, change, the change of system in Iran caused a lot of Iranians to move to Germany. And then in uh, 19, 2015, there was this horrendous situation in Syria caused about a million Syrian refugees to come to Germany and be accepted into Germany as, as migrant refugees and so on. So there are now about 5 million Muslims in Germany. There's, I'm told there's about 80 mosques in Berlin. But there's also a much larger Jewish population, which went up from 1989, 30,000, it went up to what's now estimated at 200,000 Jews. It doesn't, it's dwarfed by the Muslim community. <laughs> it's much greater. And uh, in Berlin itself, you can see this, the Jews in Germany is now about 200,000, and it's estimated that there are about 40,000 Jews living in Germany, in Berlin. And they're a very diverse community. Jews in Berlin are roughly 40,000. If you look at it in religious terms, <coughs> a good many of them are Orthodox, and there's also within the Orthodox framework, there's a very significant Chabad presence in, in Berlin, as in other places in Germany. Very many of the religiously committed Jews in Berlin are essentially belong to liberal synagogues and a liberal outlook um, comparable to our own, and very many of them are religiously non-affiliated. This is not an enormous surprise. This happens in many places. If you look in terms of their origins, uh, there are a small number in Berlin of, German, of people who actually have German-Jewish heritage. They are there. They are a minority among the Jews. There's a very large number of Soviet-origin Jews. This is because of a policy decision of the German government right after the end of the Cold War. The German government announced that it would accept Soviet Jews and a very substantial number who wanted to leave the former Soviet Union, as many Jews had been trying to do for decades, and many, of course, did. If you've been trying, you know, if you now you are, can come to Germany, and a large number of them came to Germany, and a large number of them went to Berlin. There's also a surprisingly large number of Israeli Jews in Berlin. Berlin, um, there are not that many Israeli Jews in other parts of Germany, it's not unknown, but the, those Israelis who want, usually for the usual reason, uh, uh, you know, for economic opportunities, who want to. Uh, live in Germany, tend to like to come to Berlin because there's so many other Israelis in Berlin. So there's a very significant Israeli presence in Berlin, and there's all the other groups in Berlin that are also um, living there. I'm overstaying my hour, but I'm going to work on it. I, I'm, I'm getting someplace, so you'll have to give me a little more time. I want to say that in modern Germany, there are a substantial number of uh, ways in which Germany is acknowledging the past, and this wasn't immediately after the war. I can't go into the whole history of that. We could talk about it later. Uh, but beginning around the late 1960s, there was a cultural shift. There was a generational shift in Germany leading to a cultural shift 
where people, especially in Western Germany, not in East Germany, were insisting on acknowledging and confronting what had happened to Jews in the period of the war. And this led to a much uh, beginning of also saying we have to create more monuments, more memorials, more physical statements than that. They began to be built in other parts of Germany. It took a, much longer in Berlin. The whole complicated, divided situation of Berlin hindered this a bit. But once Berlin was re reunited or into a single city, there was kind of to make up for lost time. There was a burst of Holocaust memorials and monuments all over Berlin. I mean, almost every neighborhood, there's 40 to 50 separate Holocaust memorials in Berlin because almost every neighborhood, there's been an initiative, often church people and so on say, we have to do something to, to, to honor the Jews who were deported from where we, from this neighborhood or whatever. One of my favorites, if one can call a Holocaust memorial a favorite, it's maybe the wrong term, is the Steglitz uh, mirror wall in the Steglitz neighborhood, a beautiful black marble structure with the names of the 2,000 Jews who had been deported from Steglitz on a public square, a busy square, twice a week. It's a kind of flower and vegetable market. And what's fascinating is if you stand there and look at it, you look at yourself looking at the names of all these people who were deported to the camps. And it's a very strange feeling. You are trying to think, how am I reacting to looking at the names of 2,000 people from this neighborhood alone who were put on the trains and sent to Auschwitz or Sobibor or wherever. One of the other memorials, another type of memorial, something you've all heard about, are the Stolpersteine, the stumbling stones. An individual artist named Günther Demnig in the early 1990s came up with the idea that we must honor the victims of the Nazis, not only Jews, but they're the dominant number, people murdered by the Nazis, Every place, as many as one could manage, if we know that a victim of the Nazis, typically Jews, lived at a certain address, we will put a little marker, a stone that's just a fraction of an inch higher than the level of the sidewalk into that sidewalk so that you walk over it and you, you, might, you wouldn't fall, but you, you might notice something funny under your foot and look and see a sign like this that says, here wohnte Betty Cohn. Gaborna Sabatsky. Here is the what lived Betty Cohn, maiden name Sabatsky, deported on the 19th of January 1942, murdered in Riga. And it should make you stop and think. And because there were more Jews and many other na victims of Nazism, particularly many in Berlin, uh, there are so far almost 10,000 of these stumbling stones in Berlin itself. Uh, there's about 80,000 in the rest of uh, in Germany as a whole. It's an amazing project, and we could talk more about that. This is something with a special meaning to me. The, the Grunewald train station was one of the two train stations from which Jews of Berlin were deported to the camps. And uh, this one has a very significant uh, meaning for me. You go, the, the front is the old, this is, goes back to the 1920s, the cute, the pretty little building station building. It's on the main train line with many, many tracks leading in different, uh, you know, east-west. And you walk through a hallway and then you climb up some steps to the tracks. The tracks are elevated. And one of those tracks has been placed out of service, no longer to be used by trains, because it's the track from which Jews were deported to Auschwitz and Treblinka and Sobibor and so on from 1941, 42 onwards to the end of the war. And there's a little marker with the date of every deportation. And we know the names from archives that show the names of every single person put on those trains for every single date. And one of those markers is 29 November 1942. And we know from the list that that's the date that uh, my wife's grandmother was deported directly from Berlin to Auschwitz. So it's a very meaningful place. Many years ago, before she died, I was there with my wife, and we you know, put a stone on that marker. And uh, last summer, when I was in Berlin again, I put a stone there. Anyway, that's just one of these memorials, one of the 40 to 50 memorials in Berlin. Well, the most famous memorial of all, and the biggest of all, is the official Government of Germany memorial. The government of Germany, once it was decided that Germany would be, Berlin would be the capital, the government of Germany voted in the German parliament and the Bundestag 
to have an official memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. And this would be a government-sponsored project, and they set aside one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in all of Germany, a, block, a, blo a full city block, one block away from the Brandenburg Gate. This was the, 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 the commercial value of that spot is unimaginable the choice location of Berlin. And the government said this spot will be used as a memorial for the Jews who were murdered by Germany in World War II. And then people, artists could submit designs, about, I don't know, hundreds of designs were submitted, enormous, a big competition, et cetera, et cetera. The German government finally settled on a design that looked like this. Uh, thousands of stones, and you uh, walk through these stones, and as you walk, it gets deeper and deeper, and therefore the stones get relatively higher and higher. And uh, this was somehow supposed to be very evocative. People have very, very different emotions about this. I have, many people have found this an immensely moving spot and a moving experience to walk there. Other people are concerned that there's no barrier. That's the, was part of the idea. You just walk along the sidewalk and say, oh, what's this? You are, you, there's no barrier, there's nothing to prevent everyone in the most commonly frequented part of Berlin, the great tourist attraction, Brandenburg Gate and so on. Right next door, there's this, you're walking by, you're bound to stop and look at it and find out what it is. However, um, <coughs> people walk by with children. What do you expect children to do? Jump on the stones and start running around. There are adults who People find some of the stones and sit there and eat a sandwich. And then there's some people who come, oh, and you're not allowed to do that. It's a memorial site. Oh, it's a memorial site. I didn't realize, you know. And some people, even if they have been told it's a memorial site, are so fascinated by uh, this that they uh, do stuff like this at the Holocaust Memorial. And uh, people have different opinions about whether this was designed perfectly for the purpose in mind. But I have to say the location does send a message. And one other thing that is not technically a memorial, but is in many ways like one, is the Jewish Museum of Berlin. Uh, the museum is full of artifacts and it describes the history of Jews, not just in Berlin, but of Germany. It's really a history, museum of the history of Jews in Germany. But it was designed by the very prominent architect Daniel Liebeskind, who uh, took great efforts to come up with a very striking design. And from the top, you really can see it's, uh, it, it's a zigzag building, and that's supposed to symbolize certain forms of brokenness. And inside the museum, there are all these galleries that go you know, zigzag around the museum. But there's also these significant empty spaces, uh, huge empty spaces that uh, are to evoke the emptiness uh, that was inflicted on the Judy, Jews of Europe by everything that happened in the Holocaust. And um, one last thing, I promise, this is getting to the end. Uh, the, this, it, what happened to the Neue Synagoge? It sat there as a shell all through the, the years of the communist years after the reunification of Germany, of Berlin and of Germany. <coughs> Efforts were made to restore the building. They didn't try to restore the whole sanctuary, but the front part has been beautifully restored. It has not been made into a synagogue. There are other synagogues in Berlin. It's called the Centrum Judaicum. It's used as an exhibition space. It's used as a uh, space for gatherings and meetings having to do with Jewish issues and so forth. And it also holds a significant archive of German Jewish uh, documents. And in fact, I've spent some time there doing research. So, and it has this magnificent dome from 1860 has been painstakingly restored and is really one of the great landmarks of central Berlin, as you can see. Well, one last thing. You couldn't have seen this in the 18th or the 19th century. You couldn't have seen this in the early 20th century. You obviously did not see this in the time of the Third Reich. You know, nor did you see this in all those years where the dividing line between East and West Berlin was at the uh, right, ran right along the Brandenburg Gate. But in recent years, uh, every Hanukkah, a menorah is placed near the Brandenburg Gate. This is a, our symbol placed there near the single most famous monument in Germany. And that does make a statement about not just the history of Berlin, but about Berlin and Germany today. And on that note, with 
mild apologies for running a little over. I have finished what I have to say about the history of Berlin, a city for Jews and for Germans. End of lecture. So, thanks. Three minute break. Those who want to make a getaway are allowed to do it if they want, but do look at the display case on your way out. And others may want to just come a little more forward. And uh, we have time for informal discussion.
I'm, I'm very much in favor of getting a little closer, partly so I hear where I don't have to. You can sit where you want. But if you have something to say, say it loud. Let's get people a little quieter down. I will tell you that I noticed some refreshments, but I don't want to encourage that. You can't bring it really. You can bring water into the sanctuary. That's fine, but you shouldn't bring any food in. So we won't make this too long. We can go on talking over refreshments. But I'm sure there are some comments or questions. And uh, what can I say? I'd be glad to hear them and um, see if anyone has anything to say. Here's a comment. And I will make sure to remind me to repeat the question after people have asked you. Oh, Lainey, hi. Yeah. <laughs> hi. Um, for a long time, I know that the Turkish, Turkish people who were welcomed in as workers were not given citizenship, exactly. even though they'd been there for several generations. Are they yet? Yes. And that's, what about the, new, yeah. the, um, the Syrian the refugees? Yes, the OK, refugees. well, taking the first question, is about the Turks who came in the 1960s. They were called Gastarbeiter, guest workers. There was a clear implication. We're very glad that you want to work, but uh, when your job is over, go home. And many of them didn't, and uh, found other jobs. And uh, it was for a long time, Germany, the West German government, had a lot of trouble confronting the possibility that these Turks might want to become Germans. They kind of imagined they're here, they're glad they're here, they're helping the economy, they're being well paid, but they should go home to their country. And uh, more and more of the Turks stayed and found lifelong jobs and had children, and the children, of course, went to school and so on, became socialized, they were fluent in German. And in the 70s and even more in the 80s, there was growing pressure. This is ridiculous. They are like Germans. These children hardly know Turkey. They go to Turkey for two weeks or once a year to see their grandmother. They're Germans. Why aren't we giving them German citizenship? And reluctantly, embarrassingly, reluctantly, the German government made all sorts of rules. Well, we'll give people citizenship if they're fluent in German and they've lived here so and so long and all sorts of rules and regulations. And they got eventually softened up. So <coughs> it was a difficult process for the Germans to accept these Turks as Germans. That has basically been overcome. I, I still remember in 2020, 2002, I was in Germany on research and so on. And in an, I read in a newspaper article a, world, a word that oh, I had never seen in a German newspaper. It said, wir sind eine multikulturelle Gesellschaft. We are a multicultural society. It took till the beginning of our century for a German journalist to say those words. This, the, this problem has now been solved. That people, Turkish Germans, Turco, Turkish Germans, first, second, or basically now second, even third generation, are very active in German politics and so forth. Uh, the leader for a while of the Green Party of Germany was a Turkish German and so on. Just when the German society got comfortable with having Turks as Germans, came the big wave of Syrian refugees. And I, they, uh, most of them are still living in Germany. There was a lot of difficulties at the beginning with adjustments and so on, but I think most of them are living. I'm not sure, I can't answer Laney's second question, is what's the legal citizenship status of that wave of Syrian refugees? I'm not going to answer it because I don't know. But the next time I talk about anything to do with modern Germany, I'll try to have found out before that. <laughs> yeah, Bill. And then no. over here, there's something. Yeah, with, Bill. With the influx of Turks, Syrians, North Africans, or other North Africans left in, what about anti-Semitism? Well, that's a very interesting question, Bill. So with all these people uh, from uh, Muslim societies and, 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 and so on, how does this relate to the issue of anti-Semitism? Um, it's, it's an interesting problem. There is basically in Germany, as on the whole, a bigger problem today, partly simply for numerical reasons, there's a bigger problem with anti-Muslim sentiment than with anti-Semitism because of the current generation of Germans who are prone to either supranationalism or resentment of people they regard as outsiders threatening their jobs, their way of life, their traditions, and so on. They're much more conscious of Muslims than Jews. And the Jews who live in Germany tend to be very highly assimilated and acculturated. So they're less a visible, jarring presence for certain kinds of people. So there is a bigger problem of anti-Muslim sentiment in Germany 
than anti-Semitism, which is not to say that there is no anti-Semitism, quite the contrary. A lot of, also, there's a lot of people, uh, especially on the German left, with, who are very, very harshly critical of Israel, of Israeli policy, and we only know too well that in certain cases, um, the level of hostility towards Israeli policies can slide over into anti-Semitism or is indeed sometimes motivated by anti-Semitism, and Germany has that too. And there's some creepy things I remember. I should say there's some cooperation between Muslim and German groups. And I was once at a meeting, uh, just you know, sitting in on a meeting. It was held in the Dresden Synagogue, but it was a joint meeting of Jews and Muslims to deal with the threat that there might be legislation to limit the right to perform circumcisions and restrictions on the ritual slaughtering of meat. So Muslim and Jewish leaders in Germany felt they had a common cause and were going to, as a collective, petition the various legislatures and so on to permit circumcision and uh, to uh, recognize the traditional importance of Muslim or you know, halal or kosher kashrut as ways of slaughtering meat. So there was some cooperation, but sadly I've also read about some right-wing demonstration where right-wing supranationalist demonstrators who were demonstrating, who were kind of neo, uh, they were kind of basically neo-Nazis who were German neo-Nazis who were coming up with all the anti-Semitic stuff. Normally the German neo-Nazis are, are anti-Muslim and so on, but this was a peculiar demonstration where the neo-Nazis were focused on anti-Semitism and were being assisted by some anti-Semitic Muslims. Oh my God. So things like that are happening in Germany. Germany is, not a, is a long way from a perfect society, but I will say when we look at all these issues in Germany, we are not seeing things on a level that is significantly different from what you see in France. These are tap things like this are happening in Germany, but they're counterbalanced by the, um, the, the German authorities, the cultural leaders, educational leaders, etc., are deeply committed to an acknowledgement of what happened to Jews in the past and the need for supporting Jewish activity in Germany in the present. Yeah, question. Semitism in Germany, unfortunately, I am German citizen and I am very ashamed to be one because anti-Semitism is really on the rise in Germany. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I must say that the um, anti-Semitism in Germany is now coming from the former East Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they were so surprised and they couldn't say anything and they were so wrapped with Stalin's brooms that they couldn't say anything yeah. and now they have the freedom and now the anti-Semitism is coming yeah. from there. And I'll repeat if you missed some of this. It's a very important statement and this is a member of our group here is, identifies herself as a German citizen and knows about Germany. And a, I mean, I go to Germany a lot, but you're an expert. Your perception of the level of anti-Semitism is much greater than mine. I go to Germany a lot. But... Um, and you point out, I think, very convincingly to the, the significant amount of anti-Semitism that there still is in Germany, or much of it comes from Eastern Germany, because there's a lot, there are a lot of people in Eastern Germany, the former who, despite 40 years of, of German integration and so on, and total freedom to move east, west, look for work, any place, and so on, who are still quite bitter about the fact that in their perception, the West Germans run the show, and they're, they're kind of second-class citizens in their own country, and they are reproachful of the governments for being bending over too helpfully to certain minority groups and they feel they're the ones who should be giving this help and some of this anti-Semitism is motivated by that type of motion. Why are these people getting all the attention? Why not? Uh, why not? Why aren't we getting the, the, you know, the support? We're the real Germans, you know, there's this kind of nationalism. So, I, I mean, these, this is a matter of perception. Uh, how high the level of anti-Semitism and people in this audience, like Jeff, who's been very concerned with issues around, uh, Jeffrey's been very concerned with issues around anti-Semitism right here in Canada. People who work, who are dealing with the issues of anti-Semitism, different people have different perceptions of how significant that problem is. And I can't, 
I, I have to acknowledge the, the basis on which your perception is that I've maybe not sufficiently emphasized the level of anti-Semitism in Germany, although I think I stick by the, the perception I have that anti-Islamic sentiment is more powerful, more influential in much of Germany than anti-Semitic sentiment, partly because of the numbers, but it's never that simple. Um, here was a I was going to ask if you could say a bit more about the current status of the Jewish population in Berlin and, and Germany from the perspective of demographics, from the perspective, are they integrated into the full society, politically, economically? Yeah, well, you know, the Jewish population of Germany and of Berlin today, where do they fit demographically? Um, I would say the Jewish population of Germany, my perception is, first of all, socially and culturally, they are more fully integrated than many members of the Muslim communities in Germany. Secondly, um, they tend to be highly educated, which is a significant factor. And um, how integrated are they? I would say um, very many, uh, many of the Jews, and in many cases the Jews I know, you know, are very highly integrated and, and acculturated and so on. Um, but I, I, um, the Israeli presence in Berlin, I don't think my friend Michael is here, but he told me that, oh, there's Michael. Do you want to tell your story or should I tell it? <laughs> I was at a hotel and they had the Charlottenburg Daily, which was a, a Charlottenburg Weekly, which was a newspaper in English, but had a Berlin hotel. And I was reading an article about Israelis in Berlin, and the interviewer asked one if language was any problem. And he said, no, between Hebrew and English, there was no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> I, I would have known he was there, but I didn't recognize him with the mask on. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but it, it's a big, it's a, it, it, I would say there's a high level of integration, and it's not unconnected with the characteristically high level of education of most of the Jews who live in, 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 in Germany, and that goes for Berlin. Yeah. for you was about the um, how how deep do you feel like the, the sense of public memory is like with all these different memorials and um, some that are sort of more community based like the stumbling stones and some that are large in public but at the same time there's probably most people there don't know anybody Jewish like the population is so small like mm -hmm. is it kind of more of an abstraction or is it a real reckoning like how, yeah. how deeply is it felt I don't know well if you know this is the problem with, okay, the comment was, it was first an interesting point, I'll comment on both points, I hope I remember the second point after commenting on the first point, you were simply saying that you know, um, through your Israeli connections, you know about a lot of Israelis who've gone to Berlin and so on. It's, Berlin is the cultural capital of Germany now. It's, uh, uh, you know, for opera, you might want to go to, uh, you know, Munich and so on, but for the, the newer forms of cultural experience and enterprise, the, all that stuff is uh, happening in Berlin in an amazing way, and it's an art capital and a culture. There's a tremendous cultural vibrancy, and part of it is very Jewish focused. And uh, the thing is that some of there's also, I should say, a certain kind of tourist-oriented Jewish kitsch that's very big in Berlin because um, a lot of Jewish tourists come and they want, and there's you know there's a passion in Germany for klezmer music. Most of the klezmer bands in Germany aren't Jewish. Players that just they've discovered klezmer music and people seem to love that, you know, because of its Jewish association. On the other hand, your second question was, whichever I, as exactly as expected, I've already forgotten, was. Oh, just about um, how sort of um, deep and sincere do you feel like? The, oh, the public walking past monuments and so on. Thank you. Yeah. The question is how, 
I mean, people see, if you're in Berlin, you can't miss these monuments. You can't spend two days in Berlin unless you're living way out in the outskirts without walking past that great Holocaust memorial. But every neighborhood you're in, you'll pass by something like the local neighborhood memorial. Does any of this really impact people? You know, if you've walked by something a dozen times, a hundred times, a thousand times, you stop seeing it. I mean, we all have this experience that things here in Vancouver that, you know, we don't see anymore because we're so used to them. Do we really engage with them, you know, and so on. And there's a little, uh, a little of that. And very, as you correctly said, uh, there's many Germans will tell you today that they never met anyone Jewish. Or they, more correctly, and this ties in with your remark, they never met anyone they, they knew was Jewish because Germans are meeting Jews all the time without realizing that they're German. They meet, you know, uh, someone who named uh, with a, you know, a lot of Jewish names are exactly the same as German names, as we all know. So they, they meet uh, Mr. Schneider or something, and he speaks 100% perfect German, and they've, they've met him for years, and they've never, the subject, they never realize they, someone they know is Jewish. So they don't have a conscious awareness of knowing Jews, even if they do in many cases. And um, it's partly the fact that being Judaism is not as engaging an issue in German public life as the presence of five million Muslims. And partly for purely visual reasons, you're more likely to see someone and think or suspect or believe you're seeing someone Muslim than see someone who, that you think is Jewish because of just purely physical, for purely physical reasons. You're, you may be quite wrong. You may see you, someone you think is Muslim and it may be Jewish or it may be anything else. But, but so for all those reasons, a lot of Germans, they know their history, they've heard this all, but they not have little reason to actually engage with Jews or Judaism as a theme or as a subject, despite walking past that. I mean, when I was at the day I saw the Steglitz uh, mirror wall, happened to be a market day. And everyone was buying flowers and buying vegetables, and the market was busy, busy, busy. And I was the only person who was actually standing there staring at the monument. But these people may have seen it every Wednesday, you know, every Monday and every Thursday morning. They walk by this big slab of marble in the middle of the market. They're here to, they're here to buy vegetables for their, for their dinner, you know. They don't really see it anymore. Anyway, we'll take one or two more questions. I just want to say before I, I call on Joyce, we'll take one or two more questions, and then we will continue in a new venue. Maybe that's what you wanted to say. Let's go to the new no. venue. No. <laughs> we'll, we'll, um, we'll adjourn to the venue with somebody at the men's club. Thank you, men's club. It seems to have laid out refreshments for us, and we can continue the discussion, but uh, informally. Joyce. I have heard that. The, the question was, is it true that younger Germans are sick and tired of hearing about the Holocaust? And I have heard that said. I think it's very variable. I know that many younger Germans uh, are, are, are very engaged with the subject. Uh, I know a young uh, German teacher uh, who lived for a year in Vancouver and went back and became a close friend. He was a student. I'll tell you the story. He was a student. Uh, an exchange student from Germany at UBC, and he met a, a wonderful uh, member of the survivor community, whom some of you will remember, Bronya Sonnenschein. And he was deeply moved by a talk that he had heard her give, I think, at Hillel House, and uh, really became a friend of hers. And for the rest of her life, they were in contact, and he often visited in Vancouver. He became a school teacher, a social studies teacher in, in Bavaria, and every year, he has a whole unit devoted to learning about the Holocaust, and his students are deeply engaged. And he often had uh, Bronya speaking to them by video, and even after her death, he had some contact with her granddaughter and so on. You know, um, There are students whose teachers present this to them as something important, who get really engaged. You could just see that the students took this material very seriously. But I have also heard that there are young people in German, Germany who say, enough already, we've heard enough about this, we know about this, but why do we have to hear about it over and over again? But I have to tell you, I have a feeling that there may be in Canada 
students who say, yes, we know about the indigenous issues and we know about the unmarked graves and we know about the residential schools. Do we have to hear about it yet again? We will hear that kind of thing in Canada. I wouldn't say in Germany it's significantly different from things that one could imagine hearing in Canada from certain young people. Yeah, this will be the last official question and then we'll adjourn. It's actually not a question, it's just a comment. A comment, that's my, even better. In my uh, experience with young, younger German, uh, Germans, it's not so much that they're tired of hearing about the Holocaust. I think it's a question of guilt. That's, that's mm -hmm. the question of guilt, being guilty, oh, well. being, being held responsible for it. And that is what they, they refuse. Yeah, and, and, and this is a very important comment and a good one to, to, to finish on, and then I will, I will um, uh, make one last comment about all this. Um, is it that so, not so much that the young students are getting tired of hearing about the subject. Is it that they are being tired of being told either explicitly or implicitly that they should feel guilty and say, what do we have to do with this? It was our great grandfathers who were alive at that time. Why are we having this laid on us? And let me say again that um, there is a very sensitive issue with all the importance of making young people in Canada know about the residential schools and everything else related to that. Are we are expecting the young people to assume the mantle of guilt for those things? I'm not going to give an opinion about that. I'm going to simply say I see certain parallels. But I think what you said is very apt for the case of young Germans who say we don't mind. We have to know about it. It's part of our country's history. But why are pe teachers making us feel that it's, we partake, partake of the guilt? And I can see that. I just want to end on a different note. These were absolutely wonderful and important topics. I have a fantasy that in the room there, someone is going to ask me about something about Berlin before 1933, something about <laughs> something in the 18th century or the 19th century or the 20th century. I would like people, I know you are all wide awake for the first two thirds of my talk. I just want to know if anyone has anything to say about that. But I think we can correct it. I want to give a thank, a shout out to Marielle, who I think is still there for the technical stuff. She had an interesting problem here. There are two different things she had to coordinate on the screen. Thank you for the help. And um, let's adjourn to the other room and get the refreshments. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Don't adjourn. Sorry. Don't adjourn. David's got the last word. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I speak on behalf of everybody. I think people came in rather than left. I noticed someone. The opportunity to leave. Oh. Uh, some Israeli wine for you. Oh, my gosh. On behalf of the men's club. Thank you very much. And uh, just to tell you about the upcoming Oh, and events. you got the announcements. No, uh-uh. You got, got to listen to David's announcements. On the upcoming events on uh, January 11th is... Uh, we're... Where's, where's my mic? <laughs> January 11th is our poker and pastrami in person. And on February 5th is the movie night. If you like what we do here at the Men's Club, consider joining us. And if you are already a member, please remember to renew your membership. Thank you very much. It's okay. It's okay. I want my